So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Equipping Symposium. And as Larry already uh, dug out, there is a reason why we called this a symposium and not a seminar. The actual root to the word uh, symposium comes from an old English term where people used to gather in a pub and discuss things uh, that they were interested in and had a very nice, wonderful environment as opposed to a seminar, which is a talking head that you sit and, you know, are dictated to, which is boring. So we have a symposium that we're going to participate in this afternoon, not a seminar. And this is an equipping symposium for you as leaders in the church. So our desire by the time we're done this afternoon is to help one, motivate and inspire you in your role as leaders in the church. Two, help clarify our vision of this discipleship pathway. And then three, give you some real practical skills that you could take and begin to implement as you lead and influence others. So that's the three outcomes. When we finish around 2.30 or so, you'll have to tell us if we landed the plane at the right airport instead of just circled for a while. So let me pray for us, and we'll get started, and then uh, we'll see where the Lord, what airport we, uh, airport we land in. Jesus, thank you again for this day. Thanks for these people that we get a chance to co-labor with you together in uh, seeing the gospel advance, disciples made, and the nations reached from this local church. We love you. We thank you for the privilege it is to co-labor with you and ask the Lord now that all that we do and say in the next couple of hours would be for your glory, that you would be exalted in our midst. And again, we're aware of the fact that the evil one would want to frustrate our efforts that he'd want to confuse us or get us off track, and we bind him in the name of Christ, asking again, Lord, that you, through your Holy Spirit who lives within us, may he guide us to the truth as you promised that he would. We pray again, Lord, that you would increase and that we would decrease. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So if you look at this agenda here, we've got three, three pieces to this little uh, symposium that we're entering into together. We have a working lunch that we're in the middle of now, so please enjoy your lunch. But again, remember that this is meant to be a symposium. So if you've got a comment or a question or if there's anything that I say or Dave says or Dana says that's unclear, just speak up. And probably for the sake of the tape, the tape, the recording, we will uh, repeat it because this is for posterity's sake. Uh, secondly, um, just... There's no dumb question or think, oh, this is so obvious to everybody else except me. Please, just, if you've got a question, let's ask it and address it because someone will have it, okay? There's no dumb questions. Um, what other ground rules? Dialogue, not a monologue. Let's have some fun, and uh, hopefully we'll land the plane at the right airport when we're done. Well, I will give you breaks, or we will give you breaks as we go through. You can see the agenda on the screen. We'll give you some breaks for a bathroom or just stretch your legs. And um, this, these timelines are approximate. If we end a session a little early or if we come back from break a little early, we'll just, just keep it moving. I know that our time on Sunday afternoons is precious, so I want to honor that. We won't go long. Hopefully, we'll end early. Everybody will be happy. Wouldn't that be a miracle? All right, let's talk about, uh, I wanted to start by giving you an example of a little tool that you could use in your life groups or in any small group or team that you're leading. You'll see this references a team, but you can use it in your life group. This comes from a ministry out of Phoenix called Leadership Catalyst that uh, Dana and I are very familiar with. They've helped the navigators for many, many years. Um, if you've not I think we mentioned the book by Bill Thrall called The Ascent of a Leader. Yeah, it's a study on the importance of character development for leaders. If you've not, I'll rec I'm going to give you some other books to, to consider reading. The Ascent of a Leader by Bill Thrall and Bruce McNichol. They're the leaders of this ministry, Leadership Catalyst. But I got this exercise from them, so I want to give credit where credit is due. And we're going to do this little exercise. This is called Affirming Each Other's Strengths. And this is a way 
to build uh, esprit de corps or oneness, unity in your group. Now, the one caveat for this is it takes familiarity uh, of each other in the group. So it's not, if you're just starting a life group, for example, and nobody knows each other yet, you haven't had a time to work some stuff out together, then you can't use this yet. But once you get a little familiar, it doesn't take a lot, but once you get some familiarity, then you can uh, do this exercise. And we're going to do it. I'll model it for you. And we're going to pick Pastor Dave as the object. Well, of course, you have to pick your leader as the object, right? And so, and again, as you as the life group leader, you're going to pick somebody in your group. You don't pick yourself, but pick someone else in your group that will be the object that you think will be a great example or model, which I know Dave will be. Okay, so here's the way this little exercise works. You select someone to be the object of the exercise. And again, remember, this is called affirming each other's strengths. So you ask every person in the group, depending on the size of the group, to think of two or three towering strengths of that individual as they contribute to your group. So I want you to be thinking right now of two, because we have the size of the group. We're going to ask everybody to pitch in and comment for Dave, OK? Two towering strengths, note key word, not just you know, the Boy Scout oath, you know, he helps old people across the street, or, you know, no, I want a character quality or a, something that you see that's an outstanding strength that you see in Dave. And it doesn't mean that we won't have overlap. I would think a lot of us will say similar stuff, right? So Dave, since you're the object of the exercise, you also have to evaluate yourself. Now, you have to come up with your own two. And then as people share, you have to write things down. This is an analog exercise, Dave. I just love using that word, analog. You're going to write your top two that you think are your contributions to this group, meaning our church. And then as people share their two, you write those two down. So you're going to have, I don't know how many of us, you're going to have 30 Comments. Some of those who just put checks because they're gonna, we're going to say the same thing, right? And then you're going to tell us at the end of the exercise how you thought you were, what you were bringing to this group, and then tell us how that hearing everybody else's comments about you impacted you. Make sense? It's a, we're affirming you. So you write your two strengths. Everybody else, come up with your two strengths for Dave. Got them? Now, you can't switch. When you hear, ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I want that one. No, just your two for Dave, OK? And we may have some outliers, but we'll have some. Towering strengths is the word. Whatever, not the outs, just towering strengths that Dave brings as the leader of our congregation. Does that make sense? Got your two? And we're just going to go around and share, OK? Share your two. And we're not, this is not meant to be a treatise or why you think that. Just, you know, two words are good. Or if you want to add a little explanation behind it, good. It's not meant to take hours. Dave, you got your two written down? Yes, I'm <laughs> Was that an affirmative? That was a yes, right? Okay, good. Now, We'll just go around, I'll just, we'll, I'll just call on you as we go through, okay? I'll start to model. Dave, I think two of your towering strengths that you bring, number one is courage. You're courageous, and I love just the series that you're leading us in right now. That takes courage to lead into that. So courage is one I appreciate in you as a towering strength. And two, I think you have a strength in evangelism. You are concerned about the lost and seeing the gospel get to the lost, and that motivates me. So courage and evangelism, my, my two. Mike. Tender heart and uh, outgoing. I'm going to repeat for the sake of the recording. Tender heart and outgoing. Enthusiasm and honesty. Enthusiasm and honesty. Karen. Passion and absolute love for his family. Passion and absolute love for his family. 
Alan, you can't switch. Come on now. None of this editing here. Yeah, I noticed. He's editing. You can't edit. Great. Give me two. Chases, in particular, chases the lost sheep. Second is enthusiasm. Great. Dana. <laughs> so chases the lost sheep slash evangelism, relational warmth. No, that's good. That's good. Loves the love for the Lord and leadership strength. preaching with passion and heart and faithfulness Preaching with passion and heart and love faithfulness to God's word. Authenticity, passion for a litany, people, passion for people. Good. Um, availability and compassion. Availability and compassion. Great, Roy. Wait, we're going to, Anna? Authentic. Are you still catching up here? Authentic. He is a tick. We had authenticity earlier. <laughs> Got it. And then openness. openness. Can you just expand on what you mean by that? Yeah. Openness, vulnerability. Hang your junk out there. <laughs> Passionate about the gospel, boldness in, in facing opposition or in dealing with opposition. Richard? Uh huh. Preacher, teacher, good. And? Heart for the Lord. Tracy, did you want to pitch in here? Good. Let's hear it. Yeah. So passionate and then relational. All right. So you can see if you're the object of this and how... Everybody's saying all these wonderful things about you, right? This is, and that, we were, I limited you to two. Normally, you would do three per. And you get a real, if you're the one object, you get a real long list and a lot of ticks because people are saying similar things, right? So before I ask Dave what his two are and how this impacted him hearing all this, what would you think if you were the object? Just put yourself in Dave's spot or somebody else if you're the object of this exercise. How would this impact you? What do you think? Yeah, that's the idea. Affirmed, it is affirming each other's strengths. And what do we mean by affirmed? Just makes you feel good? Yes. It gets to the point that you are, you're valuable and that you are making a, a, your presence is not just taking up space, but you're making a contribution, Joanna. I would think we're still known and loved. Known and loved. I'm going to keep repeating for the sake of the recording here. 
I'm going to get over using the word tape one of these days. <laughs> Anybody else? How this might impact you? Brings uniness, un unity, oneness, uneness. That was my combo there. I should eat that apple for lunch is what I need a little, uh, get the ATP running in my brain here. Um, yes, oneness, unity. Spurs you on. Yes, it motivates you, right? Makes you want to be a better person. Yeah, absolutely. Makes you want to be a better person. And it, I think for me, it helps, because I've done this multiple times in different contexts, it helps me grow in my self-awareness. Oh, that's how other people are perceiving me and what I'm bringing. I thought, and sometimes that there's a lot of, if you're very self-aware, you, there's a, an agreement of how you view yourself and your contribution and your strengths as opposed to others. But sometimes it's like wake up calls for you. Really? You think I do this or I bring this? All right, so Dave, you give us your two, what you thought your two contributions were, towering strengths, and then we're going to ask you the follow-up question. Uh, based on the number of times I heard the word passion, I shouldn't have scratched out passion to teach truth, the truth um, and replace it with longing for people to know Jesus. But in the midst, I kind of nailed, I guess, landed on two different, two things that, that were were said. Um, also, um, speaking and preaching. Um, I, I just feel like God has equipped me and is equipping me. Um, and, and I have a, I, I, I delight in those gifts. Mm -hmm. But it is... Uh, so having heard all these things that people said about you, what was... How did you think, feel about this? Um... There's something special and I would say incredibly important um, about speaking into people's lives and uh, telling them what you see and, and uh, what you value and how, certainly within the life of the church, what, what they bring to the table and what you are so um, uh, maybe, helping, maybe helping them see uh, what it is it, what it is that you value, what what the body values about your being present. Um, every single one of you, I mean, I was like, as you were saying things, I was thinking, hmm, this is what I would say to you. <laughs> uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a wonderful uh, habit uh, for us to, to, to get into. Um, I think also it helps with maybe some blindside issues. We all have them. If there's one thing I, I remember from a scent of a leader, we have blind spots. And uh, the, one of the functions and one of the reasons for the body of Christ is to help people uh, help uh, you, us, see where those blind spots are. I, I mean, we've got people in our groups um, that perhaps are hung up on the negatives and can only think or see the negative sorts of things and are keeping them from understanding and appreciating perhaps some of the... Uh, Ways that they're they're, they're blessing people uh, and contributing and strengthening the body of Christ. So anyway, it, it was it was a little awkward, uh, <laughs> but I think um, I, I I would encourage this. Uh, I would encourage this with everybody in 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 uh, your life group. Um, it's a healthy, important exercise. Yeah. You know. Yeah, again, as Leanne pointed out, you know, the whole world's a critic, and we use our own worst critics, right? Because we know ourselves better than anybody else does. So it's easy to be self-critical and think, well, what do I have to offer anybody? Or what, what, I'm just taking up space in this group or whatever. But when you begin to hear it verbalized, and you hear people saying the same thing over and over and over again, maybe not the exact same words, but similar veins, suddenly it's like, I guess I am. I do matter. My, my presence here is serving a purpose. And I am serving others and not just for my own, it's not here just for my own growth. And then what I've found, and when I do this in groups, 
again, is that it's like, can I be next? You know, can I be next? You know, when most people get the hang of it, then everybody falls in line and wants to be a part of it. I would suggest for you as well, this is uh, something that I wouldn't probably take a whole evening, you know, to do this, and it may take longer than, you know, a whole evening to do everybody in your group. So it would be a, like an icebreaker you could do in your group. One, just take one person, a different person every week to be the, you're the object now for, they'll get the hang of it after a week or two, right? And yeah, it's really a fun. Develop a habit or disposition of sort of aff affirming, affirmation. And there are other questions that I'm sure could be asked as well that. Yeah. But again, it's affirming each other's strengths. That's the idea. What, what, what do I see in you that just, I, that's Jesus-like? You know, that's just awesome. That's wonderful. We've got a lot of people who are asking, like, what, what do I have to offer? You know, what, what do I have to offer? And, and we get to help them see. That's a, that's a big deal. That's important. Yeah, absolutely. So questions or comments about how to use this, or can you see the potential in it? Yeah, so let me just encourage you to try it. One caveat, remember, you've got to have some familiarity already in the group. If you try it with people that don't know each other very well, it's kind of like, you know, you're just platitude. You know, you have a nice smile. I really like your smile. Towering strength, you know. Uh, not helpful. So there has to be some familiarity among the group before you can use the exercise. Richard. Well, I'd be, I'd be, again, I'd want to have enough familiarity in the group where I'm not too nervous that somebody's going to, when it's, you know, we pick somebody and it's like crickets, you know, for somebody. That's not a, something that I'm, I'm going to be very careful to protect that. Certainly, I don't want to embarrass anyone in front of the group. That would be terrible. Or shame them. Everybody else has strengths. I have nothing, you know. I'm just sitting here like a lump of coal, you know. So again, you, you'll know your group, you'll know people, and again, don't jump in too quickly. You've got to have a camaraderie already built, a familiarity already built in the group before you would go to this. But it doesn't take too much, you know. Once you get there, and then it's just really super fun. Any other comments or questions before I pitch this to Dave? Yeah, just a real practical Thank exercise. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Uh, very helpful. Uh, there's a companion exercise to this that once you get a little more familiarity with it, it's, um, it's called protecting each other's weaknesses. Hmm. And uh, maybe in the second symposium, if we do another one of these, uh, we'll get to that little exercise. But for now, let's work on the affirming each other's strengths. So now I've asked Dave to uh, come and take a few minutes here to tee us up for the context of the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, everybody. That was uh, wonderful. And, and I would imagine it would be a wonderful uh, trust-building exercise as well uh, within the life of the group. Um, what I wanted to show you first was this picture right here. Do we have that? There we go. How, how many people have seen this? Anybody? Um, I, this has been in what we call, well, volunteer room or the uh, copier room, and I've and I just been seeing this for years. It's about this big, and I, for the sake of the illustration, I don't know exactly how this was used, but I know how I would like to use it today. <laughs> and what I'm imagining, I mean, it's not, it doesn't take much uh, time to look at this and go, oh, well, that's, that's our church in some form or fashion, right? Over on the right-hand side, we see this building that we're sitting in right now, um, and every time that I've seen this, I was like, you know what? I wonder if this was one of those opportunities where somebody uh, maybe was in the, the early moments of this church's being birthed that somebody reached out to an architect and wanted to kind of cast vision and say, this is, what, this is what we're doing, guys. This is what we want this to look like. 
Um, and in the context of what I had preached about earlier in, in the summer and uh, using construction and building metaphors and all that kind of stuff, I began to look at this and I was like, well, let's just say for the sake of the argument that this building looks just like this. You know, it doesn't, obviously. Um, but, but what would it take to actually build that? And I was rummaging around in the basement. If you don't know, we actually have a basement. And in that basement, one of the things that we have, we have like, like, like bunches and bunches and bunches of these blueprints. And I was like, you know what? That's exactly. In fact, I had forgotten to get to or use uh, this uh, imagery in my sermon series. And so and I was pouring over these, these, um, these blueprints. And actually, I was sort of interested in having you come up and just sort of stand around here. Do you mind? Do you want to do that? For those of you who want to sit, that's cool. But I mean, if you come up here, I want you to see, because each stack of these blueprints starts with like a big overarching picture and then kind of gets a little bit more detailed and, and, all, and there are different phases and stages and that sort of thing. And so I just, I just sort of wanted you to actually see, because there's a series of questions I want to ask you about blueprints in general, how they're used, and all that kind of stuff. So just sort of gather around. Um, we have an overarching uh, uh, blueprint here of the topography and where things might go uh, and, and that sort of thing where the parking lot might go. I'm going to just fly through these sort of uh, quickly. This is our parking lot. It might actually take some mental uh, gymnastics to get your head around the, the orientation of the building. But this is as uh, the church building that we're in and the Taos room and the classrooms and all that kind of stuff. This is our parking lot. Uh, it is worth noting that the uh, uh, sidewalks were indeed um, designed uh, to go nowhere directly first. Um, <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> keep going here. Uh, we've got other things. We've got uh, illustrations. We have profiles to illustrate how uh, this is supposed to look. Um, this is, again, the, uh, this room we call the assembly room. I'm going to move through here. What was this one? This is the proposed uh, concrete. So concrete channels. Um, this is actually, I think, uh, talking about the irrigation, which didn't exist uh, uh, several years ago. And we have another um, uh, concrete sort of drainage dish over here. But I mean, the, what is it going to take to actually pull this whole thing off? It's going to require a lot of thinking. Look how detailed this is. I absolutely love this one. Um, you've got all kinds of dimensions. You've got all kinds of specifi uh, specifications, um, distances from. And if we keep going through this, you'll find you need even uh, um, answers to how high the sink should be or, or the placement of toilets and, I mean, like everything. Um, next, you have the roof. Uh, specifications about the roof, which is obviously very necessary. And then you get these like breakdowns. This is actually in here. How are these trusses going to be put together? Um, I imagine, you know, engineers, uh, 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 leaders, uh, everybody coming and going, uh, how is this supposed to go? Are you like one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, how many bolts are we going to use to fasten this at what angle? You know, all of that kind of stuff. Look at this. We got um, the first floor plan and where everything is supposed to go, including bathrooms and classrooms and the lobby. Um, and you have a door schedule. They have pictures of doors, like specific doors. Like if you're going to have that kind of door, you're going to need to do this. Oh, man, all kinds of stuff. Look at this. Uh, the ceiling panels themselves. <laughs> Is there any question about anything? Not really. You go back to a roof and looking at it from another perspective. I'm not really sure how all that works, but there we are. And then we come back to uh, illustrations of different angles of what this building is to look like at, um, You know, once it reaches completion, all the way down to the cross that we have affixed to the very top of the building. Interesting stuff. Um, we've got other pictures. Ooh, if you could hold on to that so it doesn't go sliding off, that'd be awesome. Um, I'm pretty sure this is like uh, 92? 92. 92. So my hunch. It's not signed. It wouldn't. The, they weren't the original building then. Yeah, I guess it would have been. So, so here, as we look at all of these things, as we get more and more, uh, look at this. This is a lighting plan. Where the lights are going to go, what kind of lights. I mean, all the way down to lights, all the way down to the mechanical stuff of air conditioning, uh, fire suppression, all of this stuff. Everything had a blueprint. Okay, so uh, you guys can go back to your seats. And i got some questions for you as we think about what we've just seen. And as we think about, we're going somewhere with this, right? Uh, as we think about uh, our discipleship pathway, 
let's think about these questions right here. Uh, do we have those? Here we go. What's at stake by not having detailed and exhaustive blueprints? Don't know what it's going to look like. Don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know how to build it. What was that? The end result. The end result. Don't have a plan to get there. Don't have a plan to get there. Right. Or live randomly. Live randomly. Here, here, um, what is there to gain by having good blueprints? Obviously, it's the antithesis of the, this, this, the, the first question. Um, but let me ask this third one. Who are the blueprints for? Is it just, is it just uh, construction bosses? Everybody building. I imagine these sitting out on a table or a series of tables somewhere, and everybody, everybody, some who are leading various groups of people and others who, who don't are going, what, what was that again? I got I to see, see the trust diagram. I gotta, I, I, how are we going to do this? You know, how, how's this? How are we going to do this? Um, there are other sets of blueprints where it seems that there was some collaboration and there were even changes. And those changes were noted and all that kind of stuff and then initial and that sort of thing. I, so it was a collaborative affair. It, uh, there was this master plan uh, designed by somebody that everybody seemed to get on board with and then begin to work with and that sort of thing. How do you, well, and so I'm, I've just shared how I imagine these being yours, but is, is there anything else that you can imagine? Right. Right. Improves communication. Everybody's building the same thing. That is so massive. That is so huge. Profound. Profundity. <laughs> Vision. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody's collaborating together. There's, there's unity found in the, diff, the, the diversity of the different roles and functions. There are different aspects of the building that, very, that, that some people are going to tackle and others that they're not. Um, you know, there, there are... So let's go to the, the, the next slide. I would like to think that this picture is akin to that architectural rendering um, uh, that I showed you, uh, you know, that, that, that was drawn up at some point. We've been talking about this. That, that's the grand vision. This is the grand vision. This is what we want it to look like. We long for people uh, to grow in such a way in their relationship with God, uh, having, had it sh having had the gospel uh, shared, uh, um, um, presented, responded to, that we would become not just believers, but growing believers. That we would long to see people become not just believers, but growing believers. And as you move around to the lower uh, half of the uh, diagram here, that as we establish one another, that we would, uh, we would long to see people being rooted disciples and then fruit-bearing servants as we go around the outer part of the uh, uh, the, the diagram and the pathway here, that we would, we would understand that um, each quadrant, each uh, phase is to have its own set of blueprints. Like we need, we, and we need to appreciate, I, I believe, and, and, and I, I'm committed to uh, uh, leading and seeing that we collaborate together uh, on God's master plan to see people uh, come alive in Christ, become growing believers, rooted disciples, and fruit-bearing servants. This is where God is going. This is what God wants with each and every one of us, and this is what we get to collaborate together. I, I long to see people hovering over a master plan, aware of their piece of the puzzle, aware of the strengths that they bring and the gifts that God has poured into them, that we would collaborate together and we would see this actually take place. And we would celebrate, very much like this church celebrated. I, I, I can't imagine the amount of joy uh, that would have uh, uh, certainly been present within the life uh, of, of this worshiping community as the very first phase of this building got Got built. You guys were a part of that, Alan, Karen. Phase two. There was there. There were three phases to this uh, building process, and I'm 
have a sneaking... Anyway, but that we would understand and see that the way that, that, that this gets pulled off is, is we need to drill down. We need to get on the same page. We need to understand what the blueprints are, uh, what it takes, what ministries that we need to have in place, what sort of behaviors, attitudes, dispositions that we need to have in this engage quadrant and establish that we would celebrate being on the same page and collaborating together, that we would collaborate and go, well, maybe we might adjust or tweak this and go in this direction. It's like, okay, all right. But we're all on the same page, and we all understand that it's going to be six feet here and not ten feet here, you know, that sort of a thing. So, you know, part of what my my assumption, and I was praying that I was going to say something that was going to be helpful, (laughs) my assumption is today we're going to see some blueprints presented. We're going we're gonna to imagine together, and we're going to uh, uh, be invited toward uh, various, various blueprints that we are going to collaborate on and, and, and participate in as we uh, uh, seek to create mature uh, and fruit-bearing servants of God that have gone through the process of uh, coming to faith and growing in this faith and being rooted in their faith and celebrating the gifts that God wants uh, um, to equip them with to help others become rooted, growing, fruit-bearing servants themselves. So, um, yeah, uh, thanks for your (laughs) collaboration and uh, and your input. Any questions, thoughts? I think 1230 was my target, right? So I'm nailing it. (laughs) Any other thoughts? Oh, yeah. I had the chance to talk to somebody about her just two days ago. Yeah. The doors, um, the pulpit, the altar. Yeah. This room was not designed to be what it is today. Um, it was meant to be this multi-purpose room. If you don't know, that's a pass-through into the kitchen. This was going to be like the fellowship hall. (laughs) It's true. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So as we think about, and I love the fact that you guys have the opportunity to reflect on things that you uh, have been able to celebrate here, things we can only imagine. I, I, I want us to dream. Seriously. I want us to dream. I want, I, I want this not to be some flat, two-dimensional sort of, sort of thing that we would appreciate um, uh, the, the dynamic here. That we're, we're actually inviting God uh, to, to literally transform lives and relationships. That we would collaborate together and we would have these stories that we want and that need to be told, that ought to be told. Um, and that we would be sitting on the edge of our seats and we would, uh, yeah, I, like I have a passion. Like I get, I get kind of worked up. <laughs> but I, I really do people want more than anything else uh, I want people to know who Jesus is. Because when you know, that's the big deal, right? That's the big thing. When you know Jesus and you've uh, experienced his love and his grace and you are coming to terms with who he is and what God has done and, you know, everything begins to shift. Uh, everything, uh, healing takes place. Uh, anyway, so... Um, 
In order to do that, we're going to need to design and, and uh, elaborate this pathway to such a degree that we can, we can agree, you know what, if we're going to have a growing believer or a rooted disciple, we're going to need to talk about this. Like, that would be super helpful, right? You know? Like, how do we, do, how do we work this out in the, in the context of marriage or parents, parenting or finances or whatever? Um, what are some foundational issues that are I- important, in, you know, as we encounter people? And we will. We will find people who are all along the spectrum in different, different places. And all of a sudden, if we've got a plan, if we've got blueprints, we're like, okay, 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 foundation, right, 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 right. We're going to go over here to foundation. Or maybe it's a roof or it's a finish, you know, exterior finishing job or an interior plumbing job or whatever. Just use the, <laughs> the, uh, the imagery. <clears throat> We've got a plan. So together we're going to collaborate on creating a plan and a set of plans so that we are actually pulling this thing off and we're unified in, the, in doing so. So that's what I got. Thank you, Dave. You're going to be released for a 10-minute break, stretch, and then please come back in 10 minutes, if not before. And Dana is going to take us into the first session of the afternoon on Jesus and disciple making. So you've got a 10-minute break. Go. See you back here directly. Thank you for coming back. Always, I know, it's kind of a, it's the old uh, first grade teacher who got the get well card from her uh, first grade class and said, We're, we wish you well, looking forward to having you back by a vote of 15 to 14. <laughs> so thank you for coming back. It's my privilege to introduce Dana to you, who will be speaking uh, during this session on Jesus and disciple making. So Dana, if you would come up here, I will pray for you. Jesus, thank you again for this opportunity we have to be equipped to serve you. We ask again, Lord, that you would guide us to your truth just as you promised. We pray that everything we do and say would be acceptable in your sight. And I pray again your anointing upon Dana as she leads us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, um, I'm going to be using page three as a handout in the syllabus which was prepared for you. And uh, the topic that we are going to look at is called Jesus and Disciple Making. I really appreciated, Dave, the sharing of the blueprints of this church and as knowing what I was going to (laughs) share because you are giving us the physical blueprints for a physical plant. God is giving, through the word of God, he gives us a spiritual blueprint for disciple making or the discipleship pathway. There is a spiritual blueprint, which we are engaging in putting together, as Dave was referring to, well, maybe we should do this or this or this or this. So it's really exciting, because walking away from looking at the original plans on Wilson, right now, it's kind of like we're at ground zero with the disciple making pathway. And you all have been engaged as life group leaders for a while, some more than, longer than others, but it's like, this t- at this time, the idea is to gather together and to determine together the spiritual blueprint as God sees it and then how we will apply that at Wilson Church. So my job today, um, I made it really easy for myself, the job that I took on today, because I'm just going to share with you uh, what God has taught me personally. And basically, you could even call this a testimony to you today about Jesus and disciple making. Um, there are quotes, there are three uh, points that I will not cover all of it. I will major on point number two. But uh, for each section, there is a quote from a book by Robert Coleman called The Master Plan of Evangelism. Did you know that these quotes were in here? Okay, because when he said there's a master plan, I went, yeah, good job. <laughs> so, I was literally praying that I would be on the same page. 
Well, I think we're on the same page. So the master plan of evangelism is by a man named Robert Coleman, and it originally was printed in 1964. And then later on in 1987, Robert Coleman wrote the master plan of disciple making. Now, this man presently is a distinguished professor of evangelism and discipleship at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Um, but he was born in 1928. And two interesting points on this guy for our, this group is that he, was, he pastored a Methodist church between 1949 and 1955. And he was the professor of evangelism at Asbury Theological Seminary, 1955 to 83. So he has some Methodist roots in him, and I had no idea that was true. If, if, if you read his book, it's, I like it, not because it's a good read necessarily, but it's so scriptural. <laughs> he, just, he, he takes the idea of evangelism but really, he, he can't not talk about a master plan of evangelism without talking about making disciples, which is why this book is so rich. That's why I have quotes from him for every section. I don't worship this guy. I just think he thought long and hard about this topic. He's written two books on it, and he's kind of the go-to guy in a lot of places on disciple making. OK. So the big question God wanted me to present to you today is the same question I presented to myself, and that is why. Why make disciples? In my 20s, back in the 70s, Tom and I got involved with the Navigators, and we had been in a Baptist church prior to being involved with the Navigators. You know, the Baptist altar call every Sunday, come believe in Jesus, I surrender all. That was the church I kind of grew up in and came to Christ in. And uh, then Tom, when Tom came to Christ, we started going to that same church when we were about 20. And we did evangelism in this church every Tuesday night. That was a program that we had, Tuesday night evangelism. And we would go out, and we lived in Cocoa Beach, Florida, Cape Kennedy, at the time called Cape Canaveral. And we would go out, on, get on a bus for evangelism. And they would drop couples. Tom and I were a couple, but other people were just paired up. And they would drop us off at the end of a street all through Cape Canaveral. And we had been trained on how to share the gospel. And actually, it, it was good training. Uh, we just opened up the four spiritual laws, and one of us would read it, and the other would pray, and then the person would respond to, have you ever prayed this prayer before? Would you like to pray this prayer? One night, we went on an evangelism, and Tom shared. We went from house to house. And by the way, that doesn't happen anymore. In fact, if you saw us coming today, what would you do? You would shut the curtains, you would lock the door, and you would go, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but 1971, 70, 69, 70, back when they had bus ministries and all that. Well, see, you were five years old missing all the fun, missing the fun. <laughs> So uh, anyway, so one night we were on evangelism, and we had not really done this before. And I said to Tom, you will do all the talking, and I will do all the praying. <laughs> and so he had to take the people through it. But if you know my husband, like some of you guys do, he's a teacher. That's what he does. I mean, God has gifted him. He's, he doesn't know how not to teach. You know, I'll, I'll say, what should I do tomorrow? And when it comes to my hair, he'll go, well, first of all, let's do this. Let's, you know, he has a top, he's got a plan, and he teaches me. But so anyway, so Tom said we would sit down. People were letting us in every house. And he would sit down and read the book. And every person we talked to that night prayed and accepted Jesus. This is in the early 70s, folks. This is when people, there was, people wanted to know if they died tonight, would they go to heaven? That was a big question back then. So we did this, and we were in this church, and people would come by the droves to our church. But as they did, it was wonderful. But we began to notice, and we were only there a short amount of time because we left for uh, Purdue in a couple years after being there. But people would come, and then they would fizzle out and not come anymore. You'd see them all the time, and then they'd stop coming. And so it was, it, it, we were shocked and didn't know why. So then when we went to Purdue University, that's where we met the Navigators. And the Navigators helped us to understand that evangelism is the beginning of making disciples, bringing people to Christ through word, deed, love, all the stuff that we do today as we are. We should have the discipleship pathway up there, actually. <laughs> as, um, thank you. As we engage with people and they come to Christ, there's more to it. There's more to growth. There needs to be establishing so that they have roots in Jesus. And they learn not only 
about the Bible. That's not the point. The point is they learn about Christ, and they fall in love with him as the Savior, King of kings, Lord of lords, and they become rooted and built up and established in him. And then they realize, I need to help others come to know Christ and help them grow in Christ. So we began to see, as we were involved with the navs, the navigators, that what we had been doing was not wrong. It's just that we weren't giving people all that they needed. So we began training with the navigators after a few years around them. And we are both known for saying to the navigators, we don't want to be on staff. You have got to convince us. God has to convince us to be on staff. So that is when I began asking, why? Why make disciples? Because, to be honest with you, making disciples takes, it's a lifestyle. It is not just coming to church on Sunday and saying, hey, how are you? Oh. Making disciples is a lifestyle. It's a calling that all believers have been initiated with from Jesus. So let's look at some of these. Uh, as I was going through, the, through growth in the 20, my 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and finally in my 60s, I found myself... Um, just drawn to the book of Matthew. And just so I kept reading the book of Matthew over and over and over. And then God just gave me a blueprint of how Jesus rolled out his plan for making disciples. And he gave me the why. And that took, you know, I've been making disciples for like 45 years when I really finally came to grips with why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I needed that. Because what, when, when I'm, I'm engaging in making disciples, it's, it's not easy because people can go crazy with you, people, just a lot can happen. And so you have to understand, we have to understand why. Why am I doing this? So I just love that in one book, in the Gospel of Matthew, we can see how Jesus rolled out his plan, his blueprint for making disciples. Before we get into the rollout, I just want to talk about Jesus. In uh, number one, Jesus was a teacher. So how did he pass on his vision for making disciples? His desire was that all people in the world would know him personally. Um, he said to the Father in John 17, 3, and, and this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's why Jesus came, so people could have eternal salvation, peace. And yet, as he rolled out the, his blueprint, <laughs> For making disciples, we begin to see that it's not enough to just help people come to Christ. We need to help them to grow, help others come to Christ, and then for them to grow. It's an ongoing, reproducible idea. The quote that I wrote in here from, um, the first quote under Why Make Disciples is from Robert Coleman. He says, his concern was not with programs to reach the multitudes, but with men and women whom the multitudes would follow. His, God's idea was to make disciples. God's idea was not to create a bunch of programs. Never in the scriptures do you see Jesus say, let's start a program. <laughs> Somehow the church, not this church, but ch I'm just going to call it the church at large, is big on creating programs for everything. And so we have to beware that we become we, we start with the disciple-making pathway, <clears throat> and we're excited, and then we become about a bunch of programs. We have to stay alive as we communicate Christ and growth with people. We need to always be focusing on people and not programs. Jesus was the teacher. Jesus was the rabbi. He was the one who rolled out disciple-making and the quote from, that I like from Coleman is, Jesus did not urge his disciples to commit their lives to a doctrine, but to a person who was the doctrine, and only as they continued in his word could they know the truth. So again, it's not about programs, and it's not about doctrine. It's about a person and people. Jesus passed on, his plans, his teaching, everything about Jesus, he had three ways of passing on. He modeled, he taught, and he prayed. Okay, what I need for you to do now is get your Bible out or get a Bible because we're going to look 
at John 17. John 17, if you will. Verses 13 to 20. And can someone please stand up and read John uh, 17, 13 to 20. And as they read this, this is Jesus praying to the Father about his followers, his disciples, because he knew he was going to be leaving planet Earth. So can somebody read 13 to 20 of John 17? And, ta- and be looking, because I'm going to ask you when they're di- finished reading, what kinds of things did Jesus pray for his disciples in this passage? All right, who wants to read? Tracy? Good. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have full measure of my joy within them. I have given them from your word, and the world world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, and they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Thanks. Okay, so what did Jesus pray for his disciples in this passage. Yes, that they would be kept from the evil one. What else? That I'd experience full measure of my joy within them. Yes. That they that they would experience the full measure of Christ's joy inside them, in them, yes. What did Jesus give them in verse 14? What had he given them as they did? He's a disciple maker. What had he given them? It's the one place where it says, I gave them this. He, louder Leanne? The word. <laughs> the word. He gave them, he gave them the word. Super crucial. It's the one thing he says, I gave them this. And then what, what was the response? How did they handle the word? Yes. He gave them the word. And they obeyed the word. And then one of the outcomes is they were hated by the world, right? Right. What else stands out to you? They're not of the world. world. Yes, they're not of the world. They are different. Yes, in verse 20, right? I am not praying only for these disciples, his 12, but also for all who will ever believe in me through this message, this message or their message. So Jesus, in his prayer, two things that stand out to me. He had given them the word of God, and then he was praying for us on that day. He was praying for us. It's amazing that he could Fast forward to, to today. He has given that we might stand firm in the gospel and make disciples. Okay, so Jesus modeled. We don't have to really look verses of that. We know he modeled all sorts of amazing divine things, and he taught many, many things, which is throughout every verse of the Bible, and then he, he prayed his vision. And I just think John 17, I would encourage you, if you've never spent a lot of time in John 17, just to hang in there and look at that prayer of Jesus for his disciples. Because if we're going to be serious about making disciples in any form or fashion, we really need to understand what was on his heart, Jesus' heart, as he thought through helping, leaving his disciples in a healthy state. Okay, now we're going to look at number two, the rollout. And uh, Robert Coleman writes this, knowledge was gained by association before it was understood by explanation. 
Jesus had relationship with his disciples. He didn't just walk up to them on day one and go, well, my plan, my master plan of evangelism is that you guys would go make disciples. Go. He didn't do that, did he? He began with association. So we're going to look at five verses, and we're going to major on this. And how much time do I have? When do I have to be done? 1.30. OK. So we're going to look at these different chunks of verses. But what, as I, this is, for me, my big, wonderful aha as I was thinking about why do I make disciples. If you, if you look at the life of Jesus in the book of Matthew, you see that he begins with the disciples in John 1. And then as, if we get in the book of Matthew, every few chapters, he rolls out more and more what he, what he is, what he expects from them. He takes them from simple, hi, how you doing, to now you go and make disciples of all nations. So we're going to look at the rollout or the progression of exposure Jesus gave his disciples about what it means to make disciples. Now, John is not in the book of Matthew, but I don't see how we can really look at his relationship to them without looking at John 1, uh, verses 35 to 38. As we look at all these verses in John and Matthew, I want you to take on the person. I want you to think, if you're Peter and you're following him around, what are you thinking? Or you're Andrew, and, he, and, and, he, and, and this happens. What do you think? What do you feel when Jesus says something some of these things to you. I always do that in the scriptures. I say, oh, look at Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. What was that like for her? How did that make her feel? How did that, you know, that's awesome. How did Martha feel? And so as we go through this, think of yourself as either Peter or Andrew or any of your favorite disciples. <laughs> um, but my favorite to look at is Peter because he shows up all the time in these verses. He's, he says some really great things and he just is just sort of idiotic in some places and, you know, it's fun. All right, John 1, 35 to 38. Who wants to read these three verses and ask yourself, this is the initial, initial time of meeting with Jesus, the first time that Andrew and another guy, they'd been hanging out with John the Baptist, and now they come up to Jesus. Somebody read that for us, those, th those verses, 35 to 38. Okay, so this is just a little snippet out of the first time that these particular two disciples came up to Jesus. Let's say that's you, and you've been with John the Baptist, and he goes, look, there goes the Lamb of God, meaning the guy I've been predicting to come, there he is. And then these two guys go over to him, and what does he say to them? What do you want? Do you want? It could be, what do you want? Or it could be, what do you want? Or what do you want? <laughs> so Jesus is, it's so interesting to me that he says to them, what do you want? He didn't teach them anything. He asked them a question. And the question was a very basic, deep human question. What do you want? And we know that when he asked that question, he wasn't asking them, what do you want to eat? He was asking them, what do you want? Now, this is the first time you've ever interacted with Jesus. So what is going, what do you think they felt like? What, do you, what would you think? How do you think you would feel? What are some reactions you might experience? Uh, terror. Uh, or, uh, I mean, interesting. Like, I don't know. Uh, it, it's sort of a profound moment, it feels like. Yeah. They're like, I don't know, what are you saying? You know, like, I don't know what to ask you. I don't even know what I want. Yes. But I know that I need to follow you. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. What other thoughts? I don't even know what I want, but I, I'll follow you. Where are you staying? What other thoughts? Well, Joanna? Ooh, good, good, good. Yeah, because John the Baptist had really set him up. He had given Jesus the clout, right? <laughs> All right, good. As he baptized him, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And people were probably at different levels of realization that the Messiah was coming. So um, one more person share about what would you feel like? What would, where, what would you say if Jesus looked at you and said, what do you want? What if he looked at you today and said, what do you want? Why is that a penetrating question? Alan. Well, that's a great comment because I think they did have to come out of surreal into real. And we'll get, as we go through these verses, they, he forced them to come into real. I love that. But right now, John 1, uh, what do you want? Uh, what do I want? Where, where are you staying? You know, what motel are you staying at? <laughs> okay. So let's go to the next uh, set of verses, which is Matthew 4. Okay. Real life, Matthew 4, everybody turn to Matthew 4, 18 to 20. And I need someone to read that. Don't be Jesus shy. Was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Uh, through what verse? Uh, 19. 19. No, 20. 20. Sorry. Okay, so this is the second scene of the rollout. Jesus at first says, what do you want? And they go to his house and hang out. And then in Matthew 4, a lot has already happened. They've been following Jesus around for a bit of time. I think 18 months, if I'm correct. A year. <laughs> Tom knows those things so good. About a year, and they'd seen, they'd seen him turn water into wine. They'd seen Nicod his conversation with Nicodemus, the uh, Samaritan woman. He had been, Jesus had already been through the temptation, and John had been put in prison. So all that had happened between, uh, what do you want to follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, as you, and it's Andrew and Peter, by the way. So Andrew was one of the first two in John 1 who came up to him. But Peter was not the other guy. Just for fun, after Andrew had said to Jesus, where are you staying? He went and got his brother and his brother's Peter, and he brought Peter to Jesus. And I love that. I love that Andrew, his claim to fame is he brought Peter to Jesus. So if you ever feel like down on yourself, just think of that one really cool person that came to Jesus because of you. You know, it's like, I, I, sometimes I'll sit around and go, I'm on Navigator staff. I've done this. I haven't done anything. I'm a loser. And then God will say, yeah, but you helped that one woman. And look, what, and look how she's helping others today. It's easy to get down on myself. And yet, Jesus affirms me that, you know what, <laughs> you brought Peter to come see me. So Andrew, though we don't hear much about him in the scriptures after this, he had brought his brother to see and meet Jesus. Okay, so how do you feel? Now you are Andrew and Peter, and Jesus says to you, you're, at, you're back fishing, you're fishing at your, with your dad, and Jesus says, come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. What do you think they felt like? What, what kind of response? They immediately left their nets. So what do you think happened for them at that moment? What did they get? Yeah, and, and in, 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 as I read through Matthew, Good thoughts. Matthew, um, I'm sorry. Jesus, I see that Jesus was stepping into their camp. He called, he said, follow me and I'll make you fisher of people. He didn't say, follow me and I'll make you a disciple maker. That comes later, but he steps into their camp. They had acquainted themselves with him. They had followed him around for a year. They saw miracles. They saw amazing things. And then he comes to their boat and he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. And so he, he speaks their language. He's in their camp as he connects with them. 
he's beginning to show them the big picture, which is it's not about fishing for fish. What I'm doing, you can do too. You can fish for people now. So they immediately left their nets to follow him with the promise that he would make them fishers of people. So this is a transitional moment for Andrew and Peter and then James and John and the other disciples. He asked them, just follow me. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's a profound moment. I mean, they're, they're walking away from the family business. Yes. And they're that, right? Like, this is a family gig. And, and uh, I've, I've also heard uh, people teach, you know, back in the day, uh, Jewish boys would basically be taught up to a certain age. And those who were the smartest right. would go on and excel and Oh. Uh, you know, perpetuate that and all that kind of stuff. And here comes this upstart rabbi and says, I want you. Yeah. Yeah. I want you to go with me. And I want to help. I want you uh, to do what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons why they would have said yes and dropped everything is because we do make the cut. We can do, you know, what this, this rabbi, he, he wants us. Even me, yeah, even me. It's possible to be profound in a number of different ways. Exactly. I mean, yes, that these. Why would they drop their nets? I mean, it's like, but if, if it was that he sees in them that they are, you've got, I promise you, if you follow me, I will make it possible. You will be able to pull this off. Right. And they had seen him for a yeah. year now, and so they knew he could pull some things off. I mean, he was a healer, changed water into wine, and he's a miraculous kind of worker. So he could do things for it. And so, yes, they left their nets. And what I love about this is, and so Jesus approached several of the Pharisees, boring old men at the synagogue, and said, follow me, and I will make you Pharisees to the people. I mean, he didn't go to the Pharisees to find recruits. He went to the common, everyday fisher people. He comes to us. The master plan of evangelism, the master plan of disciple making is for us to be involved in. He's not looking for smarties. He's not looking for professional somebodies. He's looking for people who live life and are willing to drop everything and follow him. Yeah, I don't think they fully understood even then. I don't either. Yes, yeah, say that again, Mike. Thank you for saying that, um, Mike said. They were being drawn to Christ. They knew something was different and wonderful and miraculous about him, and they knew he was the Messiah, but he was, they, were, they were in the process of being drawn to him. Just like when John said, go say hi to that guy. He's the Lamb of God. Then they, it's like, okay, you guys, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. So now they're being drawn into a much more separate, intimate relationship to Jesus and his vision. And they are more than willing to go. We see this. Okay. Yes. That's that's like that's flows through every one of these passages. Okay, let's go to the next passage, which is Matthew 9. And this is where up to now he's going into their camp. You know, he goes onto the boat. Now he's starting to bring them into his camp. Matthew 9, 36 to 38. Matthew 9, 36 to 38. Can someone please read that? Thank you. Okay, so you're standing there now. You're a disciple, Andrew, Peter. What's going on here? What? All of a sudden, he's, he's drawing them into his camp. And what is his camp? They were fishermen. What is it, the camp of Jesus? You're going to have to follow my thinking, huh? Yes? Yes. Say it again. The 
camp of the harvest. There's a harvest out there, people. Crowds, crowds people. But, there, but when he looked at the crowds, what did he, he saw harvest. He saw souls that could be harvested. He didn't just look at the crowd and say, what a bunch of losers. They're, they're confused and they're helpless. It says Jesus had compassion, and so he talked about the harvest. The compassionate Jesus recruited them to a harvest. That's his camp. If you're standing there and you haven't really heard about the harvest, what do you think they felt like? It's starting to get serious now following Jesus. You know, fishers of men, labor in the harvest, what is this? It's different. Any thoughts on that, laboring in the harvest, or Alan? Change of lifestyle. Yes, change of focus, perhaps, too. Change of lifestyle, change of focus, purpose. Good job. They're asking, like, who, who is this kingdom for? And Jesus keeps asking. He's, he's approaching some pretty sketchy people. Right. No, I wasn't, but yeah, go ahead. Right, like, you know, like, who's this guy? I'm pretty sure they were rolling up on this thing. They were waiting for Jesus to read the riot act and all the stuff that he's done wrong. And he's like, come follow me. And they're like, wait a minute. Like, what? Yeah, so um, yeah. this, 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 what, and, you know, you, I give you guys permission to say whatever that means. This kingdom, whatever that means, it seems to be a pretty hodgepodge, you know, it's like everything. It's like people that we would not expect yet he's still inviting, and yet he's still longing to be known, like, where are you going with this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he says the harvest is great, the workers are few, and then the challenge he gives them, the answer to being moving compassionately is to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, to send out laborers. When we were at Purdue about the second or third year there, I went to a prayer meeting with a bunch of women. And the woman leading the group said, tonight we're going to pray over Matthew 9, 36 to 38. Will someone please read it? And it says, so pray ye therefore to the Lord of harvest that he will send out workers in the harvest. And then we will all break up into groups and pray. And I remember not, realize, not even being aware of anybody in the room, because I remember that God, the Holy Spirit, was saying to me, you're going to pray for workers to go out? Aren't you willing to be one yourself? And I said, Pocket of hand. <laughs> And God dealt with my heart that night, and he said, you've been leading studies, you've been engaging, but this is about the harvest, and I need you to pray that, yes, Dana, that workers will go out, but part of that prayer is that you would be willing to be one of those workers. And in my heart of hearts, it was like, I don't want to be a missionary. <laughs> and if you know us, you know that we ended up being missionaries <laughs> to Indonesia. So... Pray to the Lord of the harvest. So Jesus starts with, what do you want? I'll make you a fishers of men. And then he says, the harvest is plentiful. Pray that God would send out workers. And by the way, you have to be one too. <laughs> the, word, the word he kept coming to is responsibilities. Because, Ooh. He, because he's taking you and saying, I'm bringing you this far, but now you're going to be responsible. Mm. Oh, so good. Responsibilities. I've taken you this far, but now you're going to incur responsibility, and you're going to understand my, my vision is the harvest of souls. Correct. All right. Let's go to the next verse. Now we're getting into the really good stuff, the hot stuff. All right, Matthew 16. And so what I'd like to do with Matthew 16, I want to divide this uh, into this, the reading into two chunks. The first part of this reading um, is uh, verses 13 to 20 in Matthew 16, and the second part is verses 21 to 25. So who can read 13 to 20 for us?
Okay, that, that, those verses, that section of verses, I, I just, it's so loaded and very heavy. But uh, let's just talk about Peter there. Peter gets kudos in this passage, right? Peter nailed it. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So what, tra what growth or transition do you see in their following Jesus as his disciples at this point? Yes, and they can, instead of him saying who he is, they're telling him who he is. He's gotten them to the point where they are saying, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. So they're confident and convinced. Okay, now let's quickly move on to the next chunk of Scripture, which is 21 to 25, and then pay, again, pay attention to Peter in this passage, okay? Who wants to read 21 to 25 through 25? Uh, can you go through 25? Okay. So, yes, thank you. So, what dynamic now is introduced into this disciple? Relationship to Jesus. What's it introduced here? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Okay. And what else? What other thoughts came to your mind? To me, this is a very tran most transitional passage with Peter and Jesus, and ex Jesus exposing them to his plan, his purpose, his mission. Yes. And to be as we are singularly focused, to realize it's going to cost me something to follow Jesus at this level. It's going to be like dying. It's going to be like dying. Picking up your cross and going to your death. Exactly. Yes, and that is the scope of the commitment he's now inviting them into. Uh, you know, we've come a long way from what do you want to I'm going to die on a cross, and by the way, if you want to follow me and be my disciple, you will need to be able to take up your cross daily and follow me. And like Dave just said, taking up your cross means you're on your journey to death. Yeah, they would have known that. They would have known that, right. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he is presenting a new dynamic, the dynamic of suffering as part of the kingdom work. It's part of the disciple's life. It's a discipleship lifestyle to go through suffering for the sake of the kingdom. Now, things can happen to us that are very awfully hard, tragic and, tragic and traumatic, etc. But the suffering he's talking about here is, is a willingness to be persecuted for our belief, for our faith. And that comes in many forms and fashions today. <laughs> okay, I, somebody in their own words, in verse 24, Dave already read it to us a little bit about the, the cross, but can you look at verse 24 and put that in your own words, please? I need somebody to be brave and just put that in your own words. Yes. Absolute surrender to what? <laughs> to what? Christ. To Christ. Yes. To Christ and his, and his life in me, right? 
It's not a, it becomes, he's asking them to take on a focus and a lifestyle and a surrender that they don't have to think about anymore. They will automatically fall for him, fall for Jesus, do as Jesus wants them to do, obedience. It's, it's, it becomes crucial to the vision of making disciples. Making disciples is an other people mission. Making disciples isn't about me. <laughs> Making disciples isn't about me. Making disciples is about others, helping them. So there's a sacrificial spirit that we lean into as we engage with the lost and with those who are new in Christ and with those who are growing in Christ. A sacrificial spirit. I hear my phone. I'm sorry. It's, I'm getting texts from my kids probably. Okay, okay, so let's go to the last chunk, which is Matthew 28, probably the most famous set of verses when we think about being a disciple. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And I want somebody to read this, but as we read this, I want you to, I want you to take note as we read this, these couple of verses about disciple making, making disciples. What stands out to you personally as, you, as we go through these three verses, okay? Who wants to read it? Good. So what stands out to you as you hear Jesus at the end of Matthew? He's about to ascend shortly, and he is leaving them with what they call the Great Commission, but I like to call it the final command. <laughs> it's not just a commission. It's a command. Go and do this. Go and make disciples. What stands out to you? Nice, yeah. Just by two or three or four. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a gr great insight, great insight. He, he, so he took them from what do you want to go into all the world, overwhelming command. Now, we all know that in Acts 1, he handles that really well, too, as well. You know, he's, he promises them his authority and that he would be with them, and then he gives them the Holy Spirit in Acts 1. So this process of being rolled, the vision of Christ or disciple-making being rolled out, uh, to me, makes, it gives me the oomph to understand Jesus didn't, Jesus did, he did not putz around while he went for three and a half years. Oh, I'm going over here now, I'm going to heal you. Boom. I'm going over here now, I'm going to turn water. You know, everything he did was absolutely intentional, full of focus for, for one reason alone, that you might know Christ and that you might help make Christ known to others. Absolutely intentional. The more I read through the Gospels and understand in the context, especially in the rollout of this vision and the, the discipleship pathway, that there is no mistakes with Jesus. <laughs> he has a plan, even for us personally as we engage in this. 
He is at work, and he will continue to work. So that's, that's this whole rollout that we see in Matthew, all the way from what do you want to now you go and make disciples. If you connect Matthew 4.19 to Matthew 28, 18 to 20, you have, you have the blueprint of, fishers of I'm going to make you fishers of men, and now we're getting clear. You're going to go and make disciples of all nations. Done. Yes? He taught them about the Holy Spirit in uh, John 14. We several chapters, John 14, 15, 16. He was teaching them about the Holy Spirit. Um, but um, I'm not sure exactly where, but in Acts 1, he tells them to go tarry, and he would send power from on high. So in Acts 1, we see, it's after this, that they actually receive the Holy Spirit. He's already ascended into heaven, and then he sends the Holy Spirit. You know that day of Pentecost when they're all sitting in there in the Tongues of fire come down, and everybody starts speaking in other people's languages. That is when the Holy Spirit came. And if you want to study the Holy Spirit, too, you can just go through the book of Acts and see the rollout on the Holy Spirit. It's a great study, too. Does that make sense, what I just said? Yeah, well, he talks about, I don't know if it's, I don't remember in the high priestly prayer, but in John especially, he talks to the disciples about, I have to leave, I'm going away, but don't worry, I'm sending you the comforter, you're not going to be alone. He's, he's hinting at it, but they didn't get, you know, they weren't fully in, able to embrace what he was talking about. They didn't even understand that he was going to die on the cross at that point. So he was giving them what they needed when they needed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's so good. At the yeah. Sort yeah. Of moment. This is Jesus whom you crucified. You. Let me tell you something. This is what how, yeah, this is who he is. This is what's happening. This is written about, you know, uh, uh, before and that's what that's what's taking place right now. Uh, they finally were able to understand things that they couldn't understand prior to that. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Understanding came with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay, so um, the num bullet number three on this handout is our response. What is your response? I, we're not going to talk out loud about this, but uh, the quote that I love from Coleman uh, regarding our response is this. We have not been called to hold the fort, but to storm the heights. I know what Leanne was saying about Jesus being like a commander in, an ar in a spiritual army, that he was intentional with everything. When we begin to see that this rollout of making disciples is for each one of us, and then we have to ask the question, how am I going to, how am I going to help? How am I going to be engaged? How am I going to go and make disciples of the whole world? We have to answer that question. And I might add that as I have been studying the scriptures lately, and in the context of the United States and the global issues that we know we are all facing, I look at this and I think, when you read the book of Acts, uh, I'll just tell you one of these bullet points under here because time's almost up. But the one person in here, if you go to Acts 12, uh, Acts 12 is very, it's, it, it's a chapter that tells you a lot about Peter escaping from jail. It's miraculous. It's on and on about Peter. But before the story about Peter is verse 2. And that, it's just one verse. And it says, James, the brother of John, was put to death by the sword. And then we hear about the big miracle, which is like tons of verses. So the other day when I was in my quiet time, I thought, I just want to sit here and think about James. Because it's so easy to hang in all the, wow, what a cool thing happened in the jail. And you know, over here, this man, James, was put to death by the sword. Simple faith, strong faith. So I listed a couple of different people. Remember Stephen, he was put to death by, he was stoned to death because of his faith. And then there is Jason, later on in the book of Acts, who hosted Paul, and Paul kind of fled. His friends kind of hit him. And they took Jason and attacked him and dragged him out. So in the early days, and that's why I like this quote about, we are not, we have not been called to hold the fort, but to storm the heights. These original disciples and people who knew Jesus in the flesh, when they got the hold of the Holy Spirit in their life, they 
took off and we're kind of like, we're going out there and we are gonna, we're gonna risk it all. <laughs> so Jesus calls us to a risk it all heart. A heart that really cares about people, cares about their eternity, and wants to help them know Christ and to make Christ known. Okay, let's pray and I'll <laughs> Heavenly Father, I'm I just want to thank you for your word. That we, as your sons and daughters in Christ, that as we engage with your word, you are so liberal and kind and generous to us with what we can know about you and your heart and your vision for the world and how you do things. Help us, Father, open our eyes to really behold and to embrace what is on your heart for each one of us personally as well as the congregation at Wilson when it comes to going and making disciples throughout the world. I thank you for this group of people who have paid, uh, paid many costs to be involved serving Wilson and loving the people at Wilson. And I pray that you would speak to each of us today about how we can more closely walk with you and live a life that is in accordance with Matthew 16, 24. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, before we get into our final session and actually land the plane, I wanted to give you uh, some reading opportunities. Dana mentioned uh, The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert Coleman. Notice how thin this is. This is a short read, uh, engaging read. Like, as Dana mentioned, this has been around since 63. And this, I don't know when I got this. This was only a $2 book when I got it with 300,000 copies in print at that time. So it's well over a million now. Still very popular. Robert Coleman, excellent. This is the, I'm going to give these books to you in order of books that I would give to people that are growing in their vision for disciple making. So first book, Master Plan of Evangelism, easy read, very biblical Good stuff. That's 101. 201, Disciples Are Made, Not Born by Walt Henriksen. And again, I think what we can do on this, besides we'll have it on the tape, obviously, maybe Leanne, could I send you a list and you can just circulate it to everybody? So don't worry about copying this down. We'll get it to you. So Disci Disciples Are Made, Not Born, Walt Henriksen, that's the next level up. And again, all these are super practical. It's not just motivational theory. Uh, I think, I'll look. Maybe you can find a used copy on Amazon for a penny and pay the shipping charge, unless you're a Prime member. 301 level, Lost Art of Disciple Making by Leroy Imes. Lost Art of Disciple Making. And in the back, in the, the thing that's uh, gold in this book is the appendix. Because in the appendix, he has his discipling plans on how he would disciple another individual. So those are the three that I would give, 101, 201, 301. Master Plan of Evangelism, Coleman. Disciples Are Made, Not Born, Henriksen. Lost Art of Disciple Making by Imes. Two additional ones that you may not be as familiar with. This is a NAV Press book, relatively new. Scott Morton, still on staff of the Navigators, still active. Down to Earth Discipling, very practical. And this one is Scott and Morton. Again, we'll send you all this. We'll send you the list with all the publisher and all the dates and everything, where you can find them. And the last one, this is one you may not be familiar with. This is a South Asia Indian author. Chandapila, I ran across this when I was in Indonesia, but this has got some traction. It's been around for a while. The Master Trainer. And again, it's a simple little Bible study on how Jesus trained the 12. And it's more outline form again, so it's very easy read. But this, this gentleman walks with Jesus and knows how to make disciples. So again, we'll send you all those resources and so you can fill your begin your disciple-making library shelf. All right. It's my uh, privilege to land the plane on practical disciple-making. 
we're going to talk about real how-to stuff. What do you do with this? Now that we're motivated and convinced we're all to make disciples, how do we do this? I would remind you, if you look at our uh, discipleship pathway, that we titled this afternoon an equipping symposium, right? You'll notice where equipping fits in our pathway, right? That's not by accident that we called it an equipping because we're equipping you, preparing you to make disciples with increasing clarity and vision and hopefully some practical skills. So if you look at page four of your handout now, you'll see a house diagram. And I learned this as uh, the disciple-making house. It goes by different names Oh, if you've been exposed to this subject before. But for me, this helps me, it just kind of helps clarify again, sort through the fog of, if I want to make disciples, what do I do, really? I mean, what do I have to do to make a disciple? Well, I know what I need to do, going back to the pathway again. I need to engage them with Christ and the gospel. I need to help them become rooted in the scriptures established in their walk with God, then equip them with vision and skills to multiply their life, and then help them re-engage in this harvest that we talked about with Dana. But when I'm sitting across the table with somebody with my Bible, what do I do? Well, the, where I go with that is 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul uh, is talking about his ministry of disciple-making to the Corinthians. And there was a problem in that in the Corinthian church, they had formed kind of parties or factions, if you will. Some were saying, well, listen, I was discipled by Paul. Others were saying, well, I got discipled by Apollos. And others were saying, listen, it was Jesus was the one who discipled me. That was kind of the trump card, right? Well... He, he mildly rebukes them and then says this, starting in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 3. What after all is Apollos and what, after, and what is Paul? Only servants to whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Now let's stop right there. Observations in that passage that I just read to you from 1 Corinthians 3 about laboring in, the, in this harvest, joining into this camp of Jesus with the harvest. What stands out to you? What do you see? Different gifting, different responsibilities, different designs. Yeah, it doesn't depend upon us. It depends upon God who makes things grow, makes people grow. But it certainly does because we are what? Fellow workers with God. I think outside of the gospel, that's one of the most profound verses in the whole Bible. To think that God allows you and me to work with him. Does he need me? Does he need you? Absolutely not. But he extends to you and me this incredible privilege of coming alongside him and watching him do his Jesus-like stuff. Unbelievable. Yes, he's the one who does it all. We can be uber responsible and think it's all about us. And really, you know, we, with some of the men in the men's Bible study, you remember, uh, I think I mentioned this in that study, where we talked about being unequally yoked with Jesus. Remember Jesus? And I think the picture there is a wooden yoke for oxen pulling a cart. And Jesus is, we're yoked with Jesus, but although we're yoked with Jesus, our feet aren't even touching the ground. He's doing all the pulling. We're just along for the ride. 
Now, does that mean we don't do anything? Yes, we, we're fellow workers with him. We do work. And it is work. It's not vacationing for Jesus. It's laboring for Jesus in the harvest. But it's, he, he's all, he gets all the credit. Other observations? So we're using an ag metaphor here, right? So if you've, any of you have farm background, you know there's a lot of hard work involved in uh, bringing in a harvest. Got to prepare the ground, got to cultivate, got to weed, got to water, got to fertilize, and then finally you get to drive the combine and harvest. But there's a lot of hard work in between the planting or preparing the ground to the harvest, and it's a long-term process. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, switches metaphors in mid-sentence. We'll have to take that up with the, the Lord when we get to heaven. But in verse 9, he's, he's followed this ag metaphor, fellow workers, you are God's field, and then right in the middle, he switches to this building metaphor and continues the rest of the chapter with a building metaphor. But as God would have it, it fits with our blueprint that we were talking about earlier. You are God's, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And here's, now he continues with the building metaphor. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Observations? What do you see? in this building metaphor now. What would be, what's the same between the ag, the harvest or the farmer metaphor and now the builder metaphor? What's the same and what's different? Foundation is God in both. God makes it grow and Jesus is the foundation. What else is same and what's different? Yeah. Again, it's the same. We're all working towards the same end, whether we're aiming for the harvest or aiming to build this building, this spiritual building. But there's different people at work doing different tasks. Yeah, team effort, right? It's a reward for each uh, both agricultural and construction workers, and it's a reward according to what they contribute. Yeah, God keeps track. You can't earn your salvation, but you can earn reward. Yeah, so later in the chapter, just to repeat again for the recording's sake, later in the chapter he talks about the, as you construct or as you build, you can use good materials or bad materials. It's all going to be tested. We'll see in the end what lasts. Other? Any more? All good. So as we think about this process of making disciples, I, I, I don't do complicated people. I do simple. I've got simple mastered. But complicated, just I walk away from. It just makes me break out in a rash. So when I think about what am I trying to do when I'm discipling somebody, 
or when I'm leading, let's say, a small group, a discipleship Bible study, for example, on a Thursday morning, what am I trying to accomplish? Well, this little diagram called the Disciple Making House really helps me conceptualize and sort through the fog what I'm trying to do. So let's look at verse 11 again. As we think about a building, you know and I know that the most important part of any building is the foundation. It's not sexy, it's unseen, but if you don't have a solid foundation in a building, you're in trouble. And what is that? Isn't, there's a skyscraper in San Francisco now that's sh shedding sheets of glass off, right? Because their foundation is sinking on one side. And there's a, you know, a 30, 40, 50 story skyscraper that they have a no walk zone underneath it because you get hit by a sheet of glass coming off the side. Talk about a terrifying, talk about a lawsuit waiting to happen. This is not good. So the foundation, although it's unseen, it is probably in the process of disciple making, laying a solid foundation is very, very, very important. And so he says, Paul says, as the apostle to the Gentiles, and Corinth, obviously Gentile territory in the southern part of Greece, no one can lay, but to each one should be, careful, should be careful how he builds. No one can lay any foundation other than one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so the foundation of the, the disciple-making house is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Now, I'm going to show you here in a bit some of these foundational topics and how we would build those. But just think through, it all ties back to Jesus. Jesus is preeminent. We hold Jesus up. And if you're familiar with the wheel illustration, which kind of tries to capture the thoughts of what a New Testament disciple of Christ looks like, it's the hub. The center of the Christian life is Jesus. And as Jerry Bridges once told me, Tom, we could scrap the rest of the wheel and just make the whole wheel the hub. It's all about Jesus. He is the right answer. So we seek to center as we disciple people, we lay a Jesus-centered foundation in their life and then build on top of it. Now, often in, I'll divert here just a moment, often when we talk about disciple making, there's two, in general, two different mindsets. There's the, what we call the doctor mindset and the builder mindset. I would suggest for you, one of those is biblical and one is not. The, the, let me describe for you the spiritual doctor mentality. We, let's say we agree, I'm going to disciple you. We meet together. Let's say it's at Starbucks, and we bring our Bibles, hopefully. And we're together, and as we're drinking our coffee, I ask you, hey, how's it going if I'm the one discipling you? And you describe for me your latest spiritual illness. Well, you know, I've got this struggle. And me being the spiritual doctor, what I do is I dispense my spiritual medicine. I give you my, a couple of verses, my experience, maybe the experience of somebody else, Hopefully, we would pray together, and I send you off blessed and helped. Next week, we meet again over coffee again, and I say, how's it going? And you describe your new symptom, your new illness, and I dispense my spiritual medicine. And what has happened is I've allowed you to plug your spiritual umbilical cord into me. And now you're dependent upon me to give you life as your discipler or disciple maker. The problem is... I can't give you that life consistently because the closer you get to me in relationship, you're going to realize I got issues. I, I'm a sinner in process just like you. And I'm going to fail you. I'm going to disappoint you. You're going to see my warts as the closer you get. And suddenly, or suddenly I'm out of your life for whatever reason, or you're out of my life. You've moved, I've moved, or Somehow the relationship is broken, and now you're looking for somebody else to plug that umbilical cord into, and you may or may not find them. Rather than plugging your umbilical cord into me, plug your spiritual umbilical cord into Christ. He will never disappoint you. The closer you get, the more attractive he is. He will be with you always, as we read in Matthew 28, and never leave us. And so 
the, as I build, rather than being a spiritual doctor, I want to be a spiritual builder as I disciple others. So I'm thinking about how to proactively build into the life of those that I'm ministering to and trying to disciple, whether it's in a one-to-one context or a small group. I'm thinking about build, proactively building, and as Dave so beautifully illustrated for us earlier, I come, builders come to the building site with blueprints. They don't come to the building site thinking, you know, I kind of feel like windows today. <laughs> or maybe it's plumbing, you know? No. Now, some of us also, our temperament is such that we, don't, we feel constricted, perhaps, by plans. And that it feels like, well, you know, I thought we were to be, this is a spiritual part. We need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Absolutely we do need to be led by the Holy Spirit as we disciple others. Having said that, though, we make our plans, but then we execute our plans under the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, some people will think that, well, the plans are so restrictive, and they assume that spirituality is equated to spontaneity. That is not biblical. You know, as Dana pointed out, when I first started studying the life and ministry of Jesus, I thought Jesus just got up every day and winged it. If there was anybody that could wing it, it's Jesus, right? I mean, the God-man, perfect, sinless. And then the more I study the scriptures, it's like the scales. He didn't wing anything. Everything was intentional. He was so planned and so organized, and as Dana so beautifully spelled out for us in that rollout, so intentional, progressive, incremental, to the point where he finally gave him the Great Commission, all right, boys, go get the whole world. So as a builder, I make my plans, but then I execute my plans under the inspiration and filling of the Holy Spirit as I disciple others. No, again, for the sake of the recording, nobody was, Paul had a plan. That's why he could say as an apostle to the Gentiles, as a pioneer, he opened new turf, new geography, planted the gospel, and then moved on, knowing that the division of labor, others would come behind him. He would send some of his co-workers, but then God would bring others along, like an Apollos or others, to build on the foundation that he had already laid. He saw him, his contribution, I'm a foundation layer and I move on, which is why he can say at the end of the book of Romans, there's no more work for me to do in this part of the Roman Empire. How in the world can someone say such a thing? How arrogant. There are thousands, if not millions of people that didn't know Christ, but his strategy was plant the gospel in key transportation communication hub cities and move on because he knew it would spread from there to the surrounding province. That's why he says, my job is done in this part. I'm going on to Spain, to the northern part of the Roman Empire, and probably would end up in North Africa if he had had the opportunity. He was very strategic, very planned, and knew exactly what he was called to do, his part of this disciple-making process. Lay the foundation and move on. And for us people in in the disciple-making process, most of our ministry probably will be in that establishing piece, engaging and establishing, because that's where the bulk of the people need help. We have to get people rooted and solid in their foundation in their walk with Jesus. A few, because the laborers are few in the Matthew 9 passage, a few will be able to help equip with vision and skill to reproduce. But the bulk of our efforts will be in the establishing, helping people get rooted in their walk, meet Christ, and then get rooted in their walk with Jesus. Lay a foundation and then build on top of it. So if this this foundation laying is the establishing piece, I would suggest for you. Now let's begin to talk about what goes in the superstructure on top of that foundation. 
And the way I remember it is one verse. Again, I do simple. So it's 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, and Romans 15, 14. So let's look at Romans 15, 14. Now, Romans 15, 14 is not a teaching passage or a didactic passage, but it is illustrative of three pieces of the superstructure that goes on the foundation. And this is my little outline as I think about intentionally building disciples. 15, 14, let me read it for you. I myself am convinced, my brothers, so this is what Paul is convinced about these believers in Rome. I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are, and then he lists three things that he's convinced about them. You are full of goodness, you're complete in knowledge, and you're competent to instruct one another. So that little three-piece outline for me helps me remember, as I make disciples, and I've laid this foundation now, what do I want to build on top of that foundation? Well, the first thing he says about them that he knows, he's convinced about them, is that they are full of goodness. And goodness is a character quality. So one of the things I want to build into someone else's life is Christ-like character. So if you look at that little diagram, I put character as the roof. Because if you've got a leak in the roof, it can rot all the way down to the foundation. Now, I've got people that ask me, Tom, what about character being over here on the left or on the right? Listen, people, it's a diagram. Don't get too anal about it, right? Just work with me here. So I put character as the roof. You can put it anywhere you want. Character. So I want to help build Christ-like character into those that I'm discipling. The second thing he's convinced about them in Romans 15, 14 is they're complete in knowledge. Well, knowledge of who or what? Well, it's knowledge of God at this time, obviously. The canon hadn't been completed. They didn't have the the whole New Testament yet. Paul was writing it as he's, you know, writing to them. Romans ends up in the book. Having said that, it's knowledge of God and the Word of God. But we're not talking about an academic knowledge. Nobody's going to give you any credit for in your discipling if you can give them the outline of the book of Romans. Now, it may get you through a Bible course or a seminary course or something, but nobody's beating down your door saying, you know, I just really was wondering about an outline of the book of Ephesians. But if you can help people take the book of Romans, the book of Ephesians, or some other Bible book, and apply it to their life, they'll line up in front of your door asking you for help. So it's knowledge in the application orientation. It's take that knowledge about God and the Word of God and apply it to life. Integrate it into life, daily life. So he's convinced that about that they have Christ-like character, the goodness piece, that they're complete in knowledge, that they're growing in their understanding and knowledge of God and the Word of God and how to apply it to life. And then the last thing he says is that you're competent, that is skilled, to have a personal ministry to give it away to somebody else, to instruct one another. So the third piece of the superstructure is helping people give their life away to others, to make disciples who make more disciples. And that's vision and skill. So when I sit across a a table with my Bible open at Starbucks, and I'm thinking about building into somebody else's life, or I'm sitting in room 14 with a group of men at O dark 30 on a Thursday morning, what am I thinking about? I want to see a foundation laid, and I want to see a superstructure built that has three pieces, Christ-like character, knowledge of God and the Word of God in application sense, and then helping disciples make more disciples. That's my framework. That's my blueprint, if you will, when I think about trying to sort through all the fog and all that I want to help people with. That's it. Comments are... Feedback. I need some feedback from you on this. Questions. Does it make sense? Say something out of these three in relation to each other. Yeah, it's a nice little box. People don't fit into boxes or 
rectangles or triangles or whatever. So it's a holistic approach under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you an outline in just a moment, some real practical pieces to all this and how it relates. But people don't fit columns. They don't fit diagrams. It's unfortunately, you know, it's the ministry we love. It's people that make it challenging for us. So you, under the inspiration and leading of the Holy Spirit, will get better and better. I think I used this illustration in one of my messages. But when I, would, when I was traveling to Europe, I would go to Amsterdam on a regular basis. And if I had any free time, I would go to the Rijksmuseum, which is the National Art Museum in Amsterdam. And on the second floor of the Rijksmuseum is the Rembrandt floor. And there were whole, half of the floor on the second floor is the golden age of all the famous Dutch paint, the realists, you know, that everything looks like a photograph, which is it's me. I'm not into the Van Gogh, you know, weird stuff. I'm into the, I want, I love that. I mean, I've been, they have a Van Gogh museum. I appreciate the first half of his life. And then when he moved to Paris, he went whack, wonky, you know. <laughs> Having said that, the Rijksmuseum, back to my illustration, second floor, Rembrandt. On the second floor is these, everything from the Night Watch, which is like 20 feet by 10 feet, this huge mural, to a little picture about this high of Anna, the prophetess in the temple, that this gentleman with a paintbrush actually put pores into her. I mean, it is, it is incredible, the detail that this guy was able to pull out of a paintbrush and oil paint. And I would just sit there by the hours looking at this stuff, just amazed and marveling at the creativity, which I, don't, I can't even do stick figures. I mean, this is, this is the extent of my graphic ability here, people. Right here. This is, I'm stretched with this. So I love and appreciate that kind of talent. Having said that, what is not on the second floor of the Rijksmuseum is the messed up canvases that Rembrandt went through to get to that quality of product. He messed up a lot of canvas to get that kind of quality outcome those masterpieces, as we call them. Now, here's the amazing thing about God. He lets us mess up a lot of people in their canvases, if you will, in order to produce the masterpiece as a disciple maker. What I learned from that is I'm really not that important in the process, especially when I'm starting and before I don't really know what I'm doing in disciple making, I'm just kind of doing the best I can and hoping something good comes out of it. You know, kind of like hamburger to, hamburger to the fan, hoping something sticks. I'm using word illustrations here to try to keep you with me here. I'm trying to say that, yes, God uses us when we are just learning how to make disciples. He uses us when we think we know what we're doing. Remember, we're unequally yoked. Our feet are touched on the ground at any time. God makes people grow, not you and me. All he's looking for is people that are willing to engage with him, be available, and watch God do his amazing stuff. And then try to stay humble as people tell you, oh, man, you changed my life. You did this. And you tell yourself, I did nothing. It was God who made people grow. And it's a wonderful privilege he gives us. So, Can I throw absolutely. So, I've had privileges to be around for about 14 months now. And my life group has changed during this process. And one of the things that I always want to ask is how people are growing in the community. And the social part of life is very important. But what we do is I'll show you here in just a minute. Thank you for the tee up. Any other, before I leave the diagram, any other comments or questions on that? Leanne. Ha, <laughs> 
Yeah, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have, be very skilled. All you have to do is try and watch God use you. He'll amaze you. Correct. So, uh, so again, for the sake of the recording, all three of these found the superstructure areas in particular are at different levels of maturity and different experience levels and walk with the Lord. And so, again, it's an, that's why Imes's book is called The Lost Art of Disciple Making. It's an art, not a science. People don't fit formulas. They don't fit boxes, categories, columns. It's an art form, and that's why I like the Rembrandt illustration. It's, we're just out there doing our best. And the more experience that we get in discipling others, the better we'll get, right? But... When you're young and inexperienced, God still uses you to change people. It's, I mean, young and inexperienced in the Lord and this disciple-making process. God will use you to change people forever. It's so humbling. Almost to the point of embarrassing. You're qualified. Just stay one step ahead of a pack of hounds, right? They're all chasing you. You know, that fox, just one step ahead of the lead hound. That's all you got to be. You don't have to, you know, know everything. You don't have to have any seminary degree or anything. Just one step ahead of the pack of hounds is all you need. Let's move quickly before we run out of time here. Look at page five. So that I'm going to begin to address Larry's question about how do these interrelate? So in uh, John 4, 38, Jesus says to the 12 when they rejoin him after coming back from the Samaritan village, he, they were amazed that he was talking to this woman. And his response was, others have done the hard work and you have entered into their labors. So when you think about discipling someone else and look at what goes into that foundation piece, what goes into the superstructure, what are the, how does it all relate? Others have already figured some things out. You don't have to start with a blank sheet of paper. Now, as I disciple others, what I tell them is, start with stuff that has already been done, and then get your own experience, your own convictions, and then rip up what you were given or what you started with, and then do your own. Make your own content. Make your own convictions. Pass your life to others. So it's, when we talk about discipling, it's life-to-life -life discipling of others, not notebook-to-notebook, -notebook, not programmatic approach, as Dana reminded us. It's people-oriented. It's your life and your walk with Jesus passed to another, who passes it then to another. Now, having said that, you don't, it's not unspiritual to copy and paste to begin with. But it's not copy and paste to reach the world and make disciples of all the nations. That won't get it there. Because it's copy and paste, you internalize it, you then pass it, your life, to somebody else and so forth. But start with whatever others have helped you with. So if you look at the top, this is an establishing lifeline. I call it the lifeline illustration. Illustration, and again, this takes that pathway and lays it in a line. So we start with a, a believer on the left-hand side and move to a disciple on the right-hand side. So we talk about engaging and establishing. And these are establishing topics. And again, I, I, I would submit to you that I think a wise disciple maker uses a topical approach to discipling another. And what I mean by that is, you'll see these are just various topics that we want to address from the scriptures. As we build a foundation in someone's life, foundation laying on the left-hand side, and then building as we begin to build the superstructure and the topics on the right-hand side. 
Now you'll notice that the line continues to the right. And now we're into equipping topics that perhaps we'll get to in another symposium in the future. But right now, we're going to talk about the establishing topics. People ask me all the time, Tom, is there, um, is there importance to the order that these are listed? No, with probably one exception. And that would be, initially, if I lead someone to Christ, to faith and trust in Christ as their Savior, they respond to the gospel, the first thing I would try to get back to them with is to help them understand assurance of salvation. That is, your sins are forgiven. You can be assured today, if you were died, you would go to heaven because you put your faith and trust in Christ. You don't have to wonder about that. Beyond that, your experience, this is just my experience, these topics. And again, are there other topics besides these? Nine in foundation laying? Absolutely. There's a lot more to the Christian life than these nine topics. But this is what this is my guideline. If I'm discipling you, another individual, or leading a small group, these are my, kind of my irreducible minimums that I'd want to see these topics pretty solid in someone that I'm discipling. But remember, if I'm an individual who's discipling another individual, I'm not the only means of input and spiritual growth for them. They're going to be having their own personal Bible studies, their own quiet times. They'll be going to a church that preaches the scriptures, hopefully. Hopefully they'll be in a small group Bible study or life group where they're getting input. They're reading on their own, listening to podcasts or who knows what. But lots of input. This is just for me what I think is my irreducible minimums for quality control, for lack of a better term. In this foundation, again, as a builder with a blueprint, these are what I'm coming to the building site with. I want to build these topics into their life. The goal is to help the person begin to grow in their personal relationship with Christ. I'm not asking now, they've got everything down. Are they having quiet time seven days a week out of seven? Or are they sharing their testimony, witnessing with everybody that walks? I just want to know, do they know such a thing as yeah, witnessing and your story has power and you can tell your story to others? It'll have an impact. Do they know how to have a quiet time? And they may not be consistent yet in their quiet time, but they know what it is, and they're trying to have a quiet time, so forth. Building, now I'm beginning to look for discipline and consistency before I'm going to call them a, a disciple, a follower of Christ. And we continue to work on those foundational topics and build on others on the top. Marriage, if they're already married, Roles, basic roles of husbands and wives. If they're single, we'll talk about dating and singleness, what that looks like. And again, I would remind you, this is put together for a North American context. If, when I was in Indonesia, we had a different set of context, a different set of topics, because they had, you know, dating is kind of, you don't do dating in Indonesia for single college students. So we talk about singleness and how not to be weird when you're around somebody of the other gender. And so forth. So you can read that. And again, the goal then at the end of this building phase, where I'll call them a disciple, is to help the person make a wholehearted commitment to being involved in the command of making disciples. They don't know how to do that yet, but they're willing to be engaged and try. And then we're into equipping to help them learn how to, with vision and skill, give their life away to somebody else. So if you look at the following pages then, I've given you Bible studies, my Bible studies, on all of these topics. These are topical Bible studies. Notice I've only given you the references. This is because you're going to have to do your own Bible study. Start with these verses, or maybe you've already got your own uh, thoughts on and verses on these topics. But sometimes, like quiet time, where, do I, where would I find verses on quiet time? You know, you can't look in a concordance. If you, even if you look at a topical Bible, which is also a very nice little helpful tool, uh, a topical Bible doesn't have anything on devotions or quiet time. At least Zondervan doesn't and Naves doesn't. So you can take this, look at these verses, develop your own thoughts and convictions on quiet time, for example, and then cross-reference out from there. You know, 
there's all sorts of great study Bibles that have cross references out of these. Start with these verses and then expand your study. What I've done, is, so look at the prayer passage, Luke 11, that's the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus answered the question, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples, and he gives them the Lord's Prayer. But, I mean, there's thousands, I don't know, thousands is probably an overstatement. There's a lot of verses in the Bible on prayer, right? But I boiled it down to the top 20, 25 or so in my convictions. So start with these, and then expand from there and make it your own. It's your life, not my life. But as you do your own personal Bible study, with these topics, you'll develop depth, conviction on these various aspects of the Christian life. Now, how would you use this as a life group leader? I would pick these. One, use it for your own quiet times. Just work your way through a topic. Pick some of these verses in quiet time through them in your own personal devotions. Or two, use, it as an, use some of these verses as a part of your Bible study in your life group. And just, you can tee them up. Teach them the disciple-making house. Give them some of the verse. Show where them, show them where it fits. And teach them. So they can begin to get the vision. Show them the pathway. Show them the house. Show them some of the verses and where it's coming from. It doesn't have to be a mystery to them. And again, you're going to create vision for disciple-making and them engaging in the pathway of their own spiritual growth. There you go. I've told you all about disciple making. Go get them, boys and girls. <laughs> Comments or questions on these topical studies and how you might use them or anything else? Anything. Yeah, people freak when it's pray out loud, especially pray in a group. They freak. So I find it easier. Again, this is answering the question, how to help people learn to pray short sentence prayers out loud with others. Um, I find if I'm meeting a person at a restaurant, for example, I'll encourage them to pray for the meal. You know, and it's more than rub-a-dub-dub, thanks, Jesus, for the grub. You know, it's... <laughs> So just as we're having a conversation right now, have a conversation with Jesus about the food. You don't have to adopt a different voice. You don't have to use holy language. Just talk to Jesus about thanking him for the food. It doesn't have to be long. And that gets them a little wigged out. Usually they're praying in public in a restaurant. But it's amazing how many times wait staff will comment on at least I'm usually discipling men, other men in the group, when they, they'll comment about men praying publicly over a meal in a restaurant. Wait staff will comment on that. Hey, I saw you guys praying. Or we'll, they'll see Bibles on the table. They always comment about it. I say always. It's not infrequent. So I, just short, little, simple, non-threatening, usually one-to-one -to, -one to begin with, and then expand it to a group. That's my experience. When I was teaching my kids to pray, and I'd put them to bed at night and pray with them, we never did memorize prayers. It was, okay, you talk to Jesus, I'll talk to Jesus. But they had to pray out loud with Daddy. Somebody else, another question or comment?
So if we look at Jesus, if you look at Dana's reminder about how Jesus did the rollout, right? He incrementally increased the vision and commitment he asked, right? So it was come and see where I live to go make disciples of all the nations and then all the steps in between. The same thing with quiet time. I'm not, I'm gonna, I'll ask someone after I, I expose them to the quiet time and maybe we have a, a quiet time together. So I'm modeling with them what I expect them to be and do. Then next time we're together, it's like, hey, has God spoken to you at all from your quiet time in the last week or since the last time we talked? Assuming that they would have had at least one, maybe. Oh, I, I don't really remember. Okay, great. Can I share with you something God spoke to me about from my quiet time? So again, I'm trying to model. I'm not trying to shame them or in any way pressure them. I'm just trying to model for them what I want them to be and do. Comments or other comments or questions? I can hear the engine starting. <laughs> Let's pray and land the plane. Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that it's all about you and not dependent upon us. You are the one who makes people grow. And Lord, would you take our feeble efforts and our inexperienced skill level in all of this and turn it into something marvelous. And may we see the nations come to know you because of people from Wilson Church. May we see men and women being good seed that will go to the ends of the earth, bearing 30, 60, 100 fold. Lord, we ask that you do it for your sake and for your glory, not that we would in any way take the attention upon ourselves or even in this church. But we pray that this church would have a reputation for disciple-making and sending disciples and disciple-makers to the ends of the earth. We pray that you'd be glorified in all that we do and say. Would you protect us from the evil one as we go? We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Happy to help you in any way we can along the way.